The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks and welcome to another episode of the Engine Room Podcast. Today, I'm actually on site in what will soon work out is the capital of all things financial planning in Australia, which is sunny, sunny Hobart. Um, I've got my sunscreen on um, and it's been, it's been uh, a, a wonderful couple of days meeting with some of uh, Hobart's best financial planning practices. And to add another name of a business and a, a leader to that esteemed list, I'd like to welcome Luke Roberts from Unica. Welcome, Luke. Thank you, Roxy. It's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, we were chatting earlier um, uh, off, off, off camera. Actually, off camera. I always say that. It's, it's off mic, right? So um, we should definitely be off camera, okay? Um, about the, the marketplace and, and how you've managed to, to really build a successful business within an ecosystem or even a bubble um, and how that translates um, today. But, but all of that needs to be rewound. Because I'd love to hear how you kicked off your career in financial advice, also a bit about you and what, where you are today, because you're not an old guy. In fact, more credit to you, you disclosed that you've got a 10-week-old at home, right? So, so when I said, oh, can you manage to get some time out of the office, you said yes. It's tight. <laughs> it's tight. <laughs> That's right. So maybe a bit about um, where you started and, and, and anyone who's helped you out along the way. Absolutely. Um, Sunny Tasmania, we won't talk about your scarf then, Roxy. Um, Look, I started probably like a lot of advisors, not really knowing anything about advice and not expecting to end up there. Um, I was a... I was a farming boy growing up. Um, my we were on a small farm, and I think I had uh, ideas of moving into investment banking or or fund management, as you know, a lot of a lot of young guys um, who have an interest in economics do. So I went off and studied that, um, and I think. From memory, I'd, en- I'd enrolled in honours to do economics. So this is University of Tasmania. University of Tasmania. So your farm was regional Tasmania. That's right. It? We were north of the states, about four hours out of Hobart. Okay. Um, a small cropping farm. Um, uh, Tasmania, believe it or not, is actually the largest, I think, producer of uh, legal opium in in uh, in the world. And uh, my dad uh, farmed poppies and onions and things along those lines. Big shout out to our South American audience. That's right. Um, That's right. There'll be a lot of interest in this. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, that is if that is your real name. Yeah, so, that's um, correct. Yeah. So, um, oh, that's very, very interesting. Yeah. So I came down and, and um, enrolling in honours, I actually – had a rethink and thought, you know, I wouldn't, I just want to get into the workforce essentially. And so I applied for a job at, at Shadforth, Shadforth Tasmania at that stage, uh, which I knew did stockbroking, but I didn't know anything about it. And what year planning. was that? Uh, that would have been 2003. And Shadforth itself, quite a prominent brand in, in Hobart at the it's time, a, is that right? Yeah, that's right. It was a big brand in, in Tasmania. Um, I... I actually had to call a, a family friend to ask what a para planner was. That was the role I was going for. <laughs> a planner so, in Parramatta was yeah, my joke. I had no idea. Yep. Um, but I, I, I'd seen 
I'd seen Chad Force, knew that did stockbroken and thought, you know, that that's the direction I wouldn't mind heading. Um, so, yeah, started with them in 2003, uh, which shows my age a little bit, um, and was immediately put into um, graduate diplomas, those sorts of things that people do, and still was pretty unsure about moving into the financial planning world. I was, I was quite keen to move into the broking area of the business, um, and it was only really when I had a, an advisor who I was working for who went on maternity leave. And I, I was probably a two and a half year power planner by that stage. And I took over her business for nine months um, that I got a taste for planning and what it could be. Um, and what was the bit you really liked? I asked the people. It was the yeah. people. It was the clients, um, the conversations you're having, you know, making a meaningful difference. Power planning is a hard job. You it know, is hard. And shout out to all the power planners there. But, absolutely. Um, uh, I suppose planning gives you context as well as content, doesn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. So I um, I started my stockbroking career shortly after that. I still decided I'd go into that part of the business. Um, and it was maybe not the best timing. It was 2007 um, and walked straight into the GFC, uh, which was – Look, as, Had was, you seen the movie The Big Short at this stage or read <laughs> yeah. the book? Well, the one I actually love is um, the movie Margin Call, which I think yep. is, you know, that's a, a brilliant take on that time. But that time, yeah, it was it was um, a brilliant time for learning and it changed my trajectory, absolutely. But what I did- So you had your feet under the desk with clients for yep. a year or two yep. before the GFC? No, I was I was probably months in at months that stage, <laughs> but I'd- I'd done a year uh, looking after a book, essentially. Right. Um, so I, I had some experience with clients. Um, but broking for me was incredibly enjoyable. I, I really did enjoy it. I had a great team uh, that I worked with um, and we had great camaraderie in the office. But I felt for me personally, I struggled to see lasting value in broking uh, for clients. And I had concerns about where that industry was going. And I could- I In retrospect, very sensibly. Potentially, yeah. Um, so I think Comsec had hit roughly around the same time as you kicked off. It's very close, yeah. 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 And and as far as the client value proposition, I was struggling with with what, what yeah. that looked like in a broking world. Um, and I, I found I just kept falling back on on uh, planning and strategies and, and work that I'd learned as a financial planner uh, in training. And I found it was just much more valuable work. Um, so, so I transitioned, um, left the broking room, and began to specialise on um, financial planning clients with direct equities. At that point, so you, you almost moved the br- removed the braces a little from, bit from the from almost. the stockbroker vibe. Almost, yeah, almost. Yeah. I still yeah. like to wear a pinstripe suit every now and again, but you know, got rid of the braces. Nice, nice. Well, I'm also reading uh, your LinkedIn profile as we speak, and uh, even predating all of this was two years at Red Bull. <laughs> That's right. Actually, another brilliant. That was a brilliant job for me. Uh, How does a kid, a, a kid from a modest farming background, albeit opium, um, <laughs> end up at Red Bull? It's, uh, Did it's, you help them with the ingredients? It was an accident. Right. Um, so I was, I suppose I was a little bit shy because I came from a farming background um, and I was at the university and wanted a job and and I saw this uh, this ad for a brand manager for Red Bull and Red Bull was very new then. You know, the the only way people drank Red Bull was a Red Bull vodka or something like that, you know. Um, and and I thought, you know, I'll, I'll apply for that role. I'm probably the wrong person for it, but I'll give it a go. And so in the job interview, I'm a pretty big user of it <laughs> with an additive. Well, I actually forgot. So I got an interview and it was on the old days with an answering machine, checked my answering machine, forgot all about it. And then two weeks later, I'm checking my machine again and there's this message, hey, you've got an interview, um, can you come down? And it was the day I'd checked my answering machine. So I called them straight away and said, look, can I, can I still come for the interview? Sorry, I've, you know, I've missed your message. And they said, yep, but you've got five minutes. And Hobart being Hobart, it's not a big place. I said, I'll be there. Didn't get changed. I was wearing jeans and a T-shirt and turned up for my job interview. And um, and they said, well, you're one step in front of everyone else. We don't want someone wearing a suit. We want jeans and T-shirt. Uh, but if you had the time, you put a, got, would have worn a suit. absolutely worn a suit. <laughs> um, so, so I got the job. And the job was, it was an incredible job. At that stage, it was just about marketing the brand. And so it forced me to talk to people, forced me to make relationships, uh, my job literally was to go to parties and report back to Red Bull if they were good parties and if we should um, support them in the future. Um, but as far as um, personality went, it took me out of my comfort zone and it taught me something I would never have learned otherwise, I don't think. And and I really enjoyed it. Um, I don't think I'm a natural marketer, so probably wasn't a long-term career choice for me. 
but but it was a yeah it was a great it was a great learning curve. I probably accelerated you learning about the human condition and what made people f- buy things and think. You know, so so when you 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 were there, you you were in you then effectively were an employee under the Shadforth um, 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 umbrella. Is that correct? What That's year correct. was that? Yeah, so I was with Shadforth. Oh, it's a good question. Um, must have been up until about two thousand and fourteen, fifteen when we started Unica. But but there were some key individuals I met there, and and Shadforth was a brilliant training ground for young advisors. They not only taught taught you technically how to be an advisor, but it was very commercial. Um, you had access to the directors um, locally again. Tasmania Shadforths before they merged and created the Shadforth. We know that went into IWF and Insignia, um, and and it was competitive. You know there was nine other power planners when I went in that came wow. out of the uni intake, and and we wanted to progress. And the progression was obvious how you could do it. And so it was it was a brilliant training ground. But one of the guys I met there was Don Mulcahy, who's the managing director of Unica Wealth um, and been my business partner since we started the business uh, nine years ago. And what was what was the the spark that got you? Because you worked the Chad Force for some time, obviously. Yeah, and it was well years. when you, you, yourself and Dom got together, obviously over Red Bull and vodka, <laughs> um, or maybe a few craft beers or ciders. Um, what was the thing that you both agreed on that that drove you to to start? your own business and, and really take a financial risk? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Dom, Dom had left Shadforth's a few years before me, um, had a little sojourn uh, and then came back in to take over. It was actually an A&P book at the time and, and had started to sow the seeds of Unica as we know it today. Um, we were great mates uh, and we went on a trip to the US together and I said to him, look, I think I'm done. I think I'm done in the industry. Um, I'd... I'd done 11 years at Shadforths. I'd built my book. Um, I was earning really good money, um, but I had a lot of clients and I just didn't find it satisfying. It was, it was. Um, was it the same feeling you had with the stockbroking thing that you couldn't do yeah. the bit that you wanted to do with one of the One of the things I was struggling with um, was I didn't feel I could spend the time with people to do the absolute best I could do. Um, and, and from a, I suppose it's a pride uh, thing, but you know, I felt when I was looking those people in the eye that I could have done better. Um, I just had too many clients, essentially. Uh, so it was a really good lesson on what not to do. And I spoke to Dom, and Dom said, "Well, would you be interested? I'm I'm uh, looking at at this business opportunity." And we sat down and we did some planning and we looked at the future, and it was genuinely exciting. Um, and so, uh, would have been only months months later, maybe nine months later, uh, he gave me a call. There'd been an issue and it meant that he was starting Unica two weeks later. So I resigned that day. And, wow. And we went. And, and, we and where does the name come from? It's a good question. Uh, marketing. Um, but it's it's Latin word for individual, essentially. Okay. Um, it, originally, the word was going to be Unicus, but we thought that sounded terrible. That's the male version. It's the female version of that. Oh, fantastic. Look, I'm reading your beliefs um, on, on your website where it says, you know, we provide our clients with options, education, and clear and concise value-added advice. We believe that the best results are achieved from an open and honest relationship. And I think that kind of, when I reverse engineer that, that was, you, you're stating what you wanted, I imagine, when you put the motherhood statement of the things that you didn't yes. fulfill you in your previous roles. Although great businesses weren't exactly what you wanted. And you've, can I ask today, do you feel like you've crafted what you want or are you still on a journey? Well, it's always a journey, isn't it? I don't think you ever get to the end. Um I think we've we've built the foundations of of what we're trying to achieve. So, Unica is fundamentally built around providing great customer service. Um, you know, we see that we see that as our value, um, and and customer service can mean a lot of different things to different people. But we see it as providing high level, considered advice, listening to our clients, trying to understand them deeply, trying to understand their families, trying to understand what motivates them, and then crafting a solution. And then working with them over time to make sure they've got confidence, you know, and and that we take some of the difficult things in their life and make them simple and and hopefully give them a better life because of the work we're doing. Um, you know, one of the ways I suppose we do that is we make sure we don't take on too many clients, and that that might sound a bit counterintuitive, but we've got a great team. We can move um, with the workflow that we've got, um, but making sure that um, 
when our client comes in, we've absolutely got the time to spend that we need to with them to give them the best possible outcome. And I think- AKA your beliefs. Yeah. It's core to our business. It's mm. it's absolutely core. And, and I mean, we all say it, don't we? At the end of the day, all planners say um, that their business is designed around their clients, but, but it is the fundamental driver in our business. And yep. it's why we started in the first place, because we wanted to build something that would make a difference to not only our lives, but um, our clients' lives and end of the day, something we could be very proud of. And, and you, you emphasised there you wanted to learn more about your, your clients and their families and whatnot. Um, and before we get into unpacking the, the granularity of, of, of your practice, um, tell us a bit about you personally. Um, you know, apart from the fact that you've, uh, you're proudly a, a, a new father again. I am, yes. Um, yeah, maybe give us a bit of a feel for what you do outside of that because um, – at the end of this, we're going to let you commentate an AFL match, which, <laughs> which, uh, which was 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 the uh, the comment made when you hopped in front of a mic. So, yeah. so yeah, over to you. Yeah, just unpack that. My friend is a is a commentator, and every now and again, he drags me in to make let's let's say special comments. Um, but you know, sports always been a, a big thing in my life. I, I growing up, no one in my family was interested in sport, and I was obsessed. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't very good. That was the downside. Um, but, you know, cricket, football, um, anything that is competitive, I'm quite interested. I still play basketball now and I'm terrible. But, um, you know, a Thursday night, that's a great way to blow out some cobwebs and just, just have ah, a good time. Mate, I, 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 I play social basketball still yeah. and, 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 and legal sanctioned violence once a week <laughs> yeah. is, is a quite a good antidote. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, nothing like a bunch of old blokes whinging at an umpire about a game that doesn't matter, you know. Um so, so yeah, that's been always been a huge part of my life. Um, and you know, living in Tasmania, one of the one of the huge benefits in Tasmania is you're always close to your mates. Um, so, got you know, me, me and my wife are very lucky. We've got great friendship groups down here. We've got my family down here. She's from Brisbane, so um, her family come down regularly. But we get an opportunity to go to Brisbane somewhere warm, pretty regularly. Um, and and you know, these days it's it's funny when you say what do you do outside of work. It feels like family is is mostly what we do um, because obviously we've got two young boys, um, but I'm really happy with that. You know, that came a bit later in life to me. I had our first our first boy when I was, ah, geez, how old was I? I was 40. Um, so had to wait a little while for that, but that's that's been a, a really great journey. Um, and, and yeah, that's that's the big part of my life these days is um, obviously the business, but most of, most of my time revolves around them. And you also can uh, sort of conveyed to me earlier that between yourself and your wife, she's actually got the more interesting job and Absolutely. the more interesting person, which I got a bit of intel on that earlier. <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, you know, to have such a, a specialised and interesting uh, role for your partner must be yeah. uh, must be different. Yeah, it's actually it's been great. Um, so, so my wife is a professional violin player. She's a um, a classical musician with the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra. Um, and that's, you know, that's opened my eyes to a whole new world because I can't say I'm the most classically trained person in the world. I did play music for about 10 years when I was a kid, but again, I was pretty terrible. Um, nowhere near on the level of Edwina and her, her, um, uh, colleagues. Um, but that, you know, that's, it's, it's amazing to watch her do something that, you know, she's done since she's four years old, uh, and just be incredibly specialized at, um, and the, the skill of the musicians is is amazing. So these days you will see me at the odd uh, classical music concert, where it's probably not something I would have done a lot as a younger man. Um, and uh, and you know we've now got reasonably close ties with the TSO as well, which is a fantastic organisation. And we spoke earlier about um, and what a great segue I've just invented there with the, that hyper specialisation um, with, with your partner Edwina. Um, financial planning is heading that way as well. And potentially towards the end of this podcast, I'm going to get your views on um, the role of specialists within the ecosystem. Yeah. Because when I'm looking at what Unica does a, a, at the moment, you know, from portfolio management to risk to estate planning and whatnot, they're all definitely things that you want to offer, but it, it's becoming increasingly challenging and uh, to maintain that quality and, and delivery across all those things. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, I think, for high quality advice businesses, moving forward, specialization is just a must. It's hard to be high quality if you're a generalist uh, at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, you, it, it, there's nothing wrong with as a business having target clients, understanding what you're good at and being able to provide value at that. Um, 
and within our business, we've got people who specialize in particular areas. So, um, you know. Like what? Uh, so we've got two of our senior advisors, both CA, so they're, they're brilliant with structuring advice. Um, I've, I took a much different path with my career and spent a lot of time um, studying markets. So I head up our investment committee um, and spend more time with not-for-profits and um, family offices and designing outcomes for that. Um, and, and we've got insurance specialists as well. Um, so as a business, I would say we're relatively specialised, um, but we cover most of the standard sort of areas that financial planners do cover, but we understand that, so for instance, you know, we were discussing mortgage broking before, that's not something we do, we out, we outsource that. Um, it's not something we have we have um, good line of sight over. Um, you know, our most of our clients fit in the high net worth bucket um, who come with their own challenges and we specialise on that. And that's what we think we're very good at, so lots of structures. Well, let's let's maybe um, drill down on... on on the business of the business. So let's start with the clients. So what are the types of clients that that you've uh, that historically you've had? Yep. The clients that you find yourself working on today and, and what is, what's the aspiration for the types of clients in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'd say as a, as a business, we, we do sit at the end of high net worth uh, and that's been a, a deliberate target for us. We think that's where we can add value um, and, and that that can either be a value scenario. You know, we're looking after um, multiple structures for clients, reducing complexity um, because they have a lot of wealth, or it can actually just be a person who's building and has a lot of complexity. Yep. Um, you know, high income earner um, who's who's very time poor. Those sorts of things. Um, but we're also really conscious that we do need to build a pathway for our young advisors. So um, we've got a great team of. Um, para planners and associate advisors now who are coming through, and we use a um, you know a two advisor model. So most of our clients would be sitting with what we call A one A two advisor one advisor two. Yep. Um, obviously lead advisor and, and associate, um, which gives our associates great exposure, but we don't expect them to be sitting standalone in front of a multi structured multi entity client. From day one, it provides redundancy as well. It also allows your A one to go and have a holiday for a month, and absolutely, and uh, for someone to almost be like a locum as well. Yeah. So, um, the business itself, what's the maybe what's the headcount and and what what are the roles within the business? Yeah, sure. So we're sitting at um, seventeen onshore, five offshore at the moment. Um, shout out to VBP who look after uh, some of our administration functions, and we have two offshore power planners as well. Um, we are. Doing number six ARs at the moment, uh, and and we would be four power planners in the remainder as CSMs um, or client services managers. And, and how many family units are you looking after? Yeah, so we're six hundred family units at okay, the moment. So six ARs, six hundred family units. I know you do the A one A two. Yep. So is the A two a power planner or is that another advisor? Yeah, so it's a power planner in general, but it also can be an associate. Yep. So um, for our we we do have segments where you we do have two senior advisors in yep. meetings because um, com- really complicated businesses really complicated they need you know if that if they need a an outcome quickly and a one is not here they need someone who's yeah. really competent and across their their situation um, so it's not unusual for Dominic and myself to be sitting on some clients right um, or or Cameron and myself or, um, you know, any of our senior guys. And does that mean, therefore, that typically the uh, – the, is the business in pod? So do you have a, each advisor's – each AR's got a number of family units and, and supports that? Maybe explain what it's like to work in your practice in yep. those verticals. Yeah, so it's um, – we do work on a pod structure with our family units and our advisors. Um, you know, we think we think continuity with their with the family knowing who their advisor is is very important. And then on that, we also their A two is generally um, in that same pod. Um, we we also align a client services manager to that pod as well. So so clients have continuity of the same people looking after their situation. And as the business has grown, you know, once upon a time, I would have known every client. If I walk past them in the street, um, and it would be nothing for another advisor to be able to turn up to that meeting because we all knew our clients. But as the business has grown, that's obviously become harder. Um, so, so now the, there's a senior advisor that heads up the pod. We've got our associate advisor who will be in most meetings and and is a primary point of contact as well for clients. 
our client service manager um, who keeps the ship going in the right direction, um, and and we'll and then we use a pool power planning structure. So that that's that's your contracting kind of the engine to to knock out review documents, yep, SOAs, etc. Do you offer a wholesale or and retail offering? Or we is, do, yeah, yeah, yeah. So wholesale is something that's a bit newer to us. Um, we we've taken on some family offices where it makes a lot of sense to be wholesale. So um, that's something that we're actually finding uh, great traction with. It's really enjoyable work, um, and we think we can make a difference in that space. Um, so wholesale, yes, we do do, but our, the bulk of our clients are retail. You know, ninety nine percent. Um, so, so that's that's the structure that we're running. Um, but being able to do both is incredibly beneficial. We find we don't we don't find a lot of value just classifying people wholesale um, unless there's a genuine reason. Which leads me to the question of um, how are you how are you licensed and um, uh, maybe why are you licensed that way? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're licensed by a group called um, SGN Financial Proprietary Limited. They're a uh, private licensee. Uh, I've got six or seven groups in the license um, and run by the CEO, Dave Murray and Michelle Johns um, in uh, in all around Australia, so mostly Eastern Seabold, uh, the businesses. Um, we actually we came across the group out of our previous licensee, who was Magnitude, so Westpac uh, originally, and um, due to just the licensing environment at that stage, we're obviously talking uh, around Royal Commission. Uh, we we found that it was just too restrictive for so, what we so were trying to achieve. 2019 sort of time, around about, yeah. yeah. And um, and we knew Dave. Uh, Dave, we'd worked with at Magnitude, and um, and he's a great guy, and we had a lot of trust in him. Uh, and he was running a license at that stage of of actually all ex Magnitude businesses at that point. Uh, made a couple of calls and we knew straight away that that's that's where we wanted to go. So we transitioned to SGN um, around that time. We've been with them, yeah, probably five years now, I suppose. And and they're really uh, the 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 positives of working with a smaller licensee is I can call Dave's mobile and ask questions, get answers, and and get sensible outcomes um, when when we're looking to do something a bit different. Yeah, speed, speed and commerciality, and absolutely <clears throat> another aspect of it is we spoke earlier that that like like a few groups like this, you you then have a collective investment management yep. committee. Is it, is it, and do you guys have a voice on that at all? Yeah, yeah. So we've um, we run a the license runs an investment management group out of a standalone company called Navigar. Um, I sit on that investment committee, um, and there is there's four. Uh, advisors on that committee. There's Dave, obviously, as the CEO of the group, and we've got external um, support there with Lonsec sitting as a voting member of the license committee. Of the sorry, of the committee as well. Um, and and so it's very collegiate. Uh, there's no requirement to use the investments that. So we run a a range of SMAs, um, sector specific, but also we run two um, multi asset. SMAs, defensive and aggressive, yep. uh, with Jana support, um, who we've got a great relationship with, um, and there's no directive from the license, obviously, of of um, a preference to use the assets. But um, those, as a business, we we have lent heavily into the multi sector, multi asset SMAs because we find them as a just a great way to blend portfolios to be able to act quickly. Um, and with with the support that we've had from Jana, we've built a great a great outcome for and, clients. And what platforms does that run off? Uh, so we're running on Hub24, NetWealth and Panorama Yep. at the moment. So we're available on all three, which is great. It means we've, we've also got a lot of flexibility with clients in that yep. regard. Um, and look at the moment, the, the large portion of, of our money is probably sitting on Panorama still. We, you know, it's probably a hangover from the Shadforth days, but Shadforth's used BT Wrap. Yep. Um, and so it's sort of ingrained in some DNA there, but the other platforms obviously offer um, some great technology in relation to uh, the, the the platforms and the innovation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you're a, you've you've got a significant amount of funds per client because you have targeted that yep. that that wealth. Does that translate to the uh, a, a demand for insurance, or are your clients older? Yeah, great question. Um, I would have said up until 
up until 12 months ago, I'd say, well, we had older, wealthier clients. So our demand for insurance needs was probably less than the average of most firms. Uh, but we did our first acquisition last year with um, Nicole, Flor- Nicole Florison's company, um, Florison Financial, and she was targeting- A, a fellow um, Hobart business? Yeah, Tas- okay. Tasmanian business, um, owner-operator business. Uh, she had a team of five, I think, off the top of my head. Um, and her client segment was slightly different. She she dealt a lot more with medical professionals um, and you know people who were building wealth and had a much larger cl- um, insurance book than we had. Yep. Uh, so that's been a great learning experience, and also, um, you know, great to have someone with Nicole's knowledge on on the in, on the insurance piece as well. In 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 our group, we've got Cam Pereira from our office is also really good in that space, but we just didn't have the need for it as much with our existing clients. It was a demographic, wasn't it? Exactly. Yep. So so now we're building some solutions around that and adding some technology to help us with with that piece and to manage that piece. Um, so um, I would say that. Yeah, the answer today is different to what it would have been 12 months ago. And I suppose joining those two things together and, and on, on, on your website is the fact that um, that you advise on estate planning. Is that in conjunction with a panel of solicitors or do you have a couple of people you embedded with? Yeah, that's actually something that um, I think we do p- particularly well. Um, we, we do have a panel of solicitors we work with, um, but we do take time to get in the detail on estate planning with clients. Again, I, I suppose it's partly a function of the demographic of some of our clients that it's very likely that they're going to leave substantial wealth to the next generation and that that is front and center of their minds. So um, so we do spend time um, with clients. It's almost a mandatory conversation. Uh, we, we obviously can't write the documents, but we spend time mapping it out and then we get our panel in of, our, of solicitors to help us document up. Um, we, well, we your, first, your first thing on your process is define your vision. Yeah. Find out who you are, what your objectives are, and how you can best help, right? So so you're very much focusing on them and then now you're gonna bring in those those specialists to execute. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, state planning <laughs> From the outside, probably seems like a really morbid subject. I love it. I've made. I'm a big fan of estate planning. Yeah, yeah and it's to be honest, I, like you know, a big word for me is purpose. Um, and it it actually is the overriding purpose for a lot of our clients. You know, they want to have a good life. They want to have great retirement. They want to do the things they want to do. They don't want to have to think about their money as a general rule. But they know that there's enough there that the ultimate uh, outcome of their financial lives will be setting up the next generation. And that might be in their lifetime through, you know, living wills and um, you know, gifting those sorts of things. But it can also just be making sure that the correct steps have been made that should something happen unexpected, everyone is fine. Yeah. And then that weight is off their shoulder. And a lot of people these days are interested in what philanthropic ventures and paths that they can do as well. So uh, I suppose that scratches a niche that, that they can sort of visualize the future state of doing something good as well. Yeah, more and more. Um, I think that's that's definitely getting traction in Tasmania. Um, I know many of the Eastern Seaboard companies that are in our license was already a, a big piece and it's been a piece for us probably since day one, but we're finding more and more that we're working with clients in this space and, and philanthropic gifting um, through either in life or or through their estates. Um, and so, yeah, it's actually, for what can be a pretty mor- morbid subject, if done well, it can be uh, really positive and, and give provide clarity. direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, the actual business, Unica itself, um, how's it owned? Is it, is it owned by one people, you know, a few of you together yeah. or? Well, yeah, so it's owned predominantly by the staff of Unica. Yeah. Um, the senior senior advisors predominantly own the staff. Dom's our major shareholder. And do you have a process for ingratiating new people? Yeah. 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 Um, so we do We do also have an accounting firm, Wiseland Ferguson, who we work with. Uh, they're actually Tassie's largest accounting firm and we've got a great relationship with them. We initially, actually, they were the founding book of clients when we okay. started Unica. Okay. And when we started in 2015. We... And did you buy those book clients off them? Or... No, they rolled into our business right. and, and we gave them equity. Okay. Um, okay. Right. And, uh, you know, they'd been running their financial planning business for 16 odd years, I think, at that stage. So, um, you know, it had some good roots, um, but they wanted to focus on being great accountants. We wanted to focus on advice. So it's it worked really well. But essentially now we've got uh, WF as a, as a minor shareholder. Um, they do have representation on our board, which is great. Give us a, you know, a set of eyes from the outside. 
Check and balance those accountants, aren't they? Yeah, they're good at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we basically run an equity scheme for for key staff. Awesome. Um, and you know the the dream, I suppose, is as we're bringing through our our young talent that they participate and the business can um, you know see them going on to have great careers and be you know an ongoing entity when you know we all get old and grey and. Move off to other things. Well, that's your legacy, isn't it? Exactly. So, and and so you, you kind of. My next question was: Do you have a board structure? So you do have a a board structure or a board of advice structure. And and what's the regularity of those meetings? Yeah, so we have quarterly board of advice meetings. Um, we run monthly management meetings. Um, the board of advice meetings, you know, like any small business, I think sometimes move into more management functions and we've got to bring that back up and make it strategic, uh, which is why it's sometimes great to have the external guys on that board. Yep. Um, and and the actual day-to-day functions are run through our management meetings, which is monthly. Um, you know, our PM um, drives those um, and that's that's sort of key advisory staff in those meetings. Give a shout out to your PM. Who is it? So it's Duncan McGill. He's actually, he's actually an advisor with us um, who is transitioning to PM on 1 July. Wow. Um, well, um, I've, I've got the pleasure of his company at the VBP in August. You so, do. You do. So a, as a reward for uh, taking that uh, that, that uh, two-staged acronym, you're sending him to a tropical paradise for a week. It's a big job. It's a big <laughs> job. He'll be a busy man. Um, I'll send him back. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. And you're actually getting one of our other really good staff members, Ellie, who's head of our um, back office. So Ellie's um, Ellie's been with us from the start. She actually worked... I. I remember her first day at Shadforths when she was 18 in the mailroom. Um, so she's been with us essentially in one form or another forever. And, wow. And um, she's also going to that conference. Well, and look, you, you've got a team over there and, and although they're delivering operationally what you're after, it also matters that you build those relationships with with those team members. And absolutely. And discretionary efforts. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, where um, – so – you're based in Hobart, and the majority of your team is here. That's right. And is that the uh, is that kind of what you want to build as a future state? You want to have a very localized, hyper focused business? Look, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that that is it. Um, when we started, obviously, obviously, it's easy to stay in your own demographic, and and um, well, you've been kicking around since two thousand three or something, right? Exactly, so. exactly. So, so you do build that, but we have clients all up the eastern seaboard, uh, Western Australia, a couple of in other, in other countries, um, and we find that there really these days there's no limit um, geography with the geography of looking after clients in in other states. So. So no, I don't think we, I don't think we would say we're hyper focused on being local. Um, we enjoy being local. We want to. We, you know, one of our mission statements at the start was to be the preeminent advice firm in Tasmania. And then I think we had a look at ourselves and said, well, why would we limit that to Tasmania? Yep. You know, why not be the best you can be in any, in any um, area code? So, no, it's not. We have had advisors um, working in in Queensland. We had an advisor move to Queensland. And it worked just fine. So I think we'd be really open to, if the right opportunity came along, to to being out of the office. We might talk a bit about that at, at, as as we sort of get a bit of a vibe of what's the future hold. But what I'd like to focus on now, and thank you for giving me the nuts and bolts of of, of the types of clients, how you run your business. But I, I want to get a feel for uh, the people and culture. And the, the, sure. the three things I like to, to talk about is, why do people join you? Yep. Why do they stay and how do they grow? So- um, of your team now, what has driven those people to join you over the years? Yeah. So when we were small and starting off, we actually started with a whole bunch of people we'd worked with at Shadforths, essentially. Right. Like everyone in the office bar, I think one, had been a Shadforths employee. So I think that was trust. You know, there was a lot of trust in the um, you know, Did you make them get the Shadforth tattoo or not? <laughs> well, a couple of them used to turn up with their Shadforth, cuff, Shadforth cufflinks still, which... Uh, um, that wasn't ideal, but anyway, they were, know, the, they were the, good. The unique cufflinks were a Christmas <laughs> gift right, uh, very that's quickly. Right. That's right. Um, so that was probably the start, but then from that, obviously, you know that when you're looking to externally um, recruit, that doesn't matter much anymore. People don't know you, and you you need yeah. to have a value proposition for your for your staff. I think. Um, and what's yours? Why do they join? It's a good question. I think people would join Unica because it's it's got a clear direction. We know where we're going. Um, we can offer people um, the ability to, to progress um, at the 
at the to be where they need to be at the end of the day. And do you think if I asked other team members that they would be able to articulate the same vision that you articulate? You know what? I I couldn't say definitively yes, and that worries me. Yep. Um, I I think it's something that we can work on um, and provide clearer paths of progression, and particularly for some segments. So if you said to me, why would a young advisor want to join Unica? I could I could absolutely tell you, and I could say, well, basically we will we will have them immersed in the advice experience from day one. They will be in meetings. With and having that two tier approach exactly is is just a great yep. on the ground cold face experience. You'll be in meetings immediately. You will understand the conversations you need yep. to have with your clients. Yep. Um, so that's ob- everyone under the age of forty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's obviously the expectation that um, you know technically we're training them up correctly yep. as well, but. There's a very clear advice path, and and Unica is not a business that's ever struggled for new clients. So there's also a very clear career path as far as your A one A two turning into your A one um, over time, and and I think that for a young advisor, that's that's quite a clear path, and and I would think quite attractive. Um, and there's a there's a desire from the senior people in the business that our next generation comes through. Um, drives change, you know, helps the business uh, become will stay a modern business at the end of the day. I think, um, I think your next generation is critically important to your long term uh, growth. It's probably more in the client services area where, if you ask me, would they be able to articulate it? Maybe not. And I think we need to do some work on that. Um, I think um, we've got some some brilliant client services staff, um, and it would be. And and we see them as being, you know, obviously integral to the business. But if they said, well, if I want to move on to another role, how do I do that? Yep. And, and I think we could do more work on that. No, honesty is the best policy on that. And, yeah. and it's uh, one of the things you have done is that by, by implementing um, some – some solutions offshore that um, you've probably freed them up some of those repetitive jobs that yep. potentially, even if they wanted to do well, extra career, would be holding them back. Well, you know, I mean, VBP we we used for exactly that that process. So VBP gives us uh, continuity generally. Um, so there's there's a whole bunch of systems in the back e- back end of what we do that VBP do that if we were to lose an onshore member and we were doing that onshore. It would really blow up essentially. So, so VBP have been great for that regard. But also, we were finding we had to modify our client services role because when we started Unica, we started with a whole bunch of people. We worked at Shadforce, so they were really experienced and they knew their job inside out. And you could give them a lot of work because they knew how to do it. Yep. Um, and then suddenly we started, you know, employing from outside of that ecosystem. And I think we expected way too much. And and um, we had this expectation that that's initially how someone can come in and operate is like someone that has been doing it for ten years, and that's not the case. So we had to strip back that role, and and take functions like like preparing reviews, you know, taking functions out of their day, which can be done externally to give them more time to get through buying time, you know, and <clears throat> and get getting them in front of clients, getting them talking to um, to staff talking to product providers, those sorts of things. So so we actually changed that role a lot because we had turnover in that role, essentially. Um, and you're not Robinson Crusoe, right? Yeah. Because the last 10 years with the regulatory reform has been tough on ARs, but the silent sufferers have been the, the client service people within those businesses yeah. that just got more and more work, probably outpacing their career advancement and their income. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we were probably... I mean, there's a lot of businesses like this, but we were growing really fast at the same time. So not only were you trying to catch up with the regulatory environment, but you're also onboarding a lot of clients. Yep. Um, and that just put a lot of strain, you know, and it was, that was a really, I think we we had to put a lot of thought into that. And I think we, we've got it pretty right now, the balance. I'd um, love to hear, sorry, I'd love to hear about your tech stack. So, yeah. the, the, you know, the, 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 the ties that bind. Yep. Um, you know what? It's funny. So I'll run through what we're using at the moment. Probably like most businesses, Microsoft. Um, you know, we use SharePoint, uh, Teams. We've we've been trialing Copilot, but have actually defaulted to a couple of other AI solutions. So we use F- FileNote AI um, mm-hmm. for our for our FileNote. Okay, Kieran, we'll chuck we'll chuck a couple of links in there. Yep, FileNote AI. Yep. Um, and that's that's actually been really good for richness of content. Whereas we were finding we couldn't get the richness with with Copilot. Um, 
we we've we're onboarding. We've been working on it for a little while, but Zeppo in a in a more um, holistic function as of July. Thanks, Duncan. That'll be your job one July. Um, and and from there, we also have some really great um, tech support from Wiseld and Ferguson. So WF, sorry, it's not Wiseld and Ferguson. Um, so they've they've got a hundred staff, a hundred accountants essentially yep. that work in the building right next to us, and they've got a dedicated IT team, and who are now our dedicated IT team. So, so we we get brilliant support from them, and particularly in this day and age, we've just got to be so careful with your data. Um, you know the the security that we're using um, off off the back of their advice is. You know, when I when I see other firms, I think we're right at the pointy end of it. Well, it's non negotiable. It's it's, it's non. I mean, you can build a firm for twenty or thirty years, but if you if you get a data leak, then you're in trouble. Hundred percent. Yeah, and then other little things that, you know, we the things that we've struggled with with technology, I suppose, is we we've often tried to implement, um, and and either sometimes the complexity of our client has made it difficult. Yep. Um, so you know. You add three companies and a couple of trusts into a situation, some of the AI just can't work in that space and some of the tech. Um, so we're, we're waiting for some of that to catch up, I suppose. Um, and then, you know, standard things like um, we use Finometrica for our risk profiling so we can get that out to clients rather than them having to sit through the, the yep. forms in our office, um, last pass for all our security, yep. all those sorts of things. So tech stack wise, it's it's I don't think we'll ever say we've got it. Um, we need to do a lot of work on it, um, and and I think over time it's definitely proven to be helpful. But as far as how does our business operate and how how our efficiency is found, technology's the nice to have at the moment for us. It probably sounds a little bit. I sound like a dinosaur, I'm sure, but I think having the right people with the right mindset and the right clients is the best way to be efficient. The last the thing you added there is really important because. For years, people said, if I've got the right people doing the right things at the right time, but you've added the right clients. Yeah. And so you can build a fantastic business, but if you've got inappropriate clients, and I think that's been one of the big tectonic shifts in, in our industry with, with people hyper-focusing on the clients that they know they can add the most value to. Yeah. Would yeah. you guys Absolutely. That Absolutely. Yep. I mean, you know, if, a, if you have a client who um, fits all the metrics but doesn't take advice, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time on that client. Yeah. And they're not going to value you. Correct. And, and you're probably not going to value them at the end of the day. So um, I think we're, we're pretty hyper-focused on that and we've got an amazing group of clients. Um, you know, it's nice to look forward to the phone ringing and, you know, genuinely enjoy the conversations. Well, some of them might be listening to the podcast, so it's good to give them a, a <laughs> yeah. shout out. Yeah. Now, when you're running uh, the business of the business, um, you mentioned you have weekly meetings, but what other sort of, what other cadences of, of meetings do you have, and what are your firm's critical numbers? What are the what are the couple of metrics, three or four metrics that you obsess about? Yeah, it's a great question because again, I think it's a moving feast. You know, I think they change. Um, so we, our admin team is weekly. I'm not in those meetings. They wouldn't want me in there anyway. I'm sure. Uh, change the locks. Exactly, exactly. Our advice team meets weekly as well. Um, that's obviously a work in progress, new business um, discussion. Um, the numbers that we obsess about there is probably not so much how many is coming in. You know, that's obviously important. Um, you need to know what your pipeline is and you need to know, make sure it's within um, your expectations. But I think it's delivery. You know, delivery is a huge um, focus in those meetings of are we meeting our clients' expectations? Are we are we being the best we can be? Um, and I th because I honestly believe the rest takes care of itself over time. Um, so that's... That's definitely a function in those meetings. Um, and for our younger advisors, I think there's uh, there's definitely a need in those meetings to talk about what's gone right and what's gone wrong. Um, you know, if we're talking about did we sign these clients, did we uh, present well, um, you know, making sure that we're we're teaching and mentoring and, and all those things that were really important at the start of my career, um, being honest, you know. So they're the day-to-day they're the -day meetings. Our offshore teams – meet, I believe, weekly as well. Um, Ellie runs that, so better person to ask than me. Uh, try and stay out of that if possible. Um, and then obviously we've got management monthly. So do you do you run like a, when you're setting up your strategy for the year or your quarter, you've got a target. Yep. And then that target might have a few metrics and each division can then figure out the bit that they contribute to that target. If hopefully you hit those targets, how do you celebrate? 
Yeah, good question. Because I think oh, you can definitely get you can definitely get lost and not celebrate. You know, we're all so busy. You think to yourself, you know, that's great. We'll have to do something there to celebrate that. We we hardwire quarterly catch ups anyway. So 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 in the diary, it's happening. It's happening. So so from a C suite, you've got an impending event to do something. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that might be, you know, you try and make sure it's not always a boozy dinner. Um, it often is. Um, but, you know, that can be make sure we're getting everyone together to do something outside of the office um, and where we can just enjoy each other's company and talk about what's gone right. What kind of things have you done? Oh, it's a good question. Uh, so we, that you can remember. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Lots of dinners, <laughs> as I said. Uh, you know, the standard sort of stuff with escape rooms and um, oh, I hate laser them. tags. Escape and all rooms are the worst. Yeah, look, I'm not. Oh. I'm not the biggest fan either. We we do oh. have a staff member who won't do it because I think it, they get a bit worried about not ever getting out. Uh, <laughs> but you know, so it's all those sorts of things where you just want to get out, get out of the the day to day functions of the office. Yeah. Um. Hopefully, show some appreciation to your yeah. staff. You know, we 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 want to show we care. We want to show we appreciate them. Um, and then ad hoc, you know, I don't think anything still beats saying to someone, "Just really appreciate your work. Well done." You know, yeah, so then that that weekly forum gives you that that ability to to open up those and say you've done well here. Yeah, and they might say, well, well I need help here, and you've yeah. got that constant feedback. Yeah, and I mean the other thing that I've we've always done as a business is you know we do our you know, obviously end of financial year and Christmas and things like that, but make sure that that um, that partners spouses come along to those things all paid for by the business because I think that's really important. You know the Oh, that, I mean, the last 10, 15 years, if if you're a long-suffering partner of a financial planner or working in financial planning, first of all, you've had to put up with all the whinging exactly. that we've taken home. <laughs> Second of all, late nights. Yep. Like there's some work that needs to be done. So, so I, my history is I was always very pro that as well because at, at the end of the day, they can make or break whether or not that person thrives and, yep. s- and, and stays. Because they're their sounding board at the end of the day. So you want to give, if you can, I mean, obviously it's – it's, it's a way to say thanks. You don't want it to be a marketing tool, but um, you want to give them context. You know that the people that they're hearing about every night over a glass of wine or over the table, are people just like them, and um, you know, putting a face to the name, those sorts of things. And, so, and when when partners come up and get, geez, you're not as bad as what they talk about. <laughs> Yeah, I've probably heard that once or twice. <laughs> so, so they say that. I thought they kept calling you a banker, but it just uh, sounded like that. Um, but uh, look, I'm married to a lady who's a therapist, right? right. So I mean, um, um, we can insert the jokes, Kieran, on that one, um, the laugh track. But um, yeah, it's good to be able to, uh, you know, your, your life partner is the person that you download for sure. Um, and, yeah. and 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 sounding board, honestly, yeah. So so getting that right, very very important. Um, also, getting it right, the purpose of what you do. So we've spoken about things that you do with clients and internally, but do you have a, a program for if people have got a passion or a charity or or something like that yep. in your business, given that you, you're you not big, but you're not small. So yeah. you're kind of like, it's hard to have something big, but what yep. do you do? Yeah, we're a funny sort of number. That that 20 head number in financial planning is a it's you're not a small business. You're, you're an not awkward big, teenager. You're not a big business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you've, you've you've kind of almost there, and and um, uh, but anyway, that's not the question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes, we do. We do. So um, we we've partner each year with a group um for um donations essentially, um and historically that's been staff driven on on where that donation lands. Um, we also have a, we have a great relationship with the Hobart City Mission in Tasmania, um, where we, um, over a couple of days, our staff volunteer at their, uh, their, basically their Christmas drive where you essentially sort food packs and, and presents for people who, who might be in need over Christmas. Um, and they get an amazing amount of donations, but they need hands to labor to sort it out. So our teams go off and do that and always get great feedback from the team. Um, on how enjoyable that is, um, because it takes us out of our day, day to day. Um, so we really encourage that. We think, you know, at the end of the day, yes, we're, we're a business, but we're part of the community. So you want to be part of the community and, and show that in your actions and, and, um, and support. Um, and for our, for our organizations that we look after, uh, there's, there's typically an element of philanthropic aspect to that as far as, you know, advice fees and support yep. and things that we do. So we actually take a lot of pleasure in 
in working in our community in that regard. And you're doing what you say you, you do recommend to clients, right? So, yeah. so um, now in relation to, you mentioned that you've, you, you did an acquisition recently. If I was to ask the vision of the future for, for your practice, what, what do you see you doing over the next couple of years? And Potentially, where do you see yourself deficient? Are you, are you lacking opportunities? So you mentioned you're not lacking new client opportunities. Yeah. But have you got enough people to, to, to help them? Or have you got enough, like, are you looking for mergers? Maybe give yeah. us an idea because people listening are like, yeah, I, I might be interested in, in, in one of these activities. Yeah, sure. So the, the vision for the business is I think we've thought of ourselves as a startup since we started, but we're now nine years old, so we're not a oh, You've been doing it 20 years. <laughs> right? like, that, that's yeah. like 15 tech firm lifetimes, exactly. right? So- exactly. So we're actually like old gray hair on the, on the street. But, um, but that's sort of how we thought about ourselves. So we've basically just um, reinvested into the business all the way through. And, and we, we think we've now got a really exciting platform to grow the business. Um, the business has grown fivefold in nine years. Um, as far as revenue goes, um, and probably fourfold in people around about. Um, and we think we've got that base in, in a really nice position now. We're obviously doing our first acquisition, which has been a great learning experience for us. Um, and we think you know, we could definitely look at that again in the future. Uh, but ideally we would, we would also be looking to grow organically. You know, we, we do have a, we are in a very lucky position where people want to work with us. Uh, so finding talented staff to help us on that journey and for us to help them have careers is is the goal now. And so you're in the market at the moment for that? Or always. 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 For the right people. Okay. Yeah, yeah cool. for sure. Uh, we, we're we recruiting at the moment um, and about to add uh, another person, uh, which would be great. Um, but we're always in the opportunity for the right people. You know, yep. One thing about um, Tasmania is, you know, there's actually quite a lot of financial planning firms in Tasmania. So when you see a talent, you want to make sure, even if you don't have a role, find a role um, for the right person. Hire the, hire the best people in the talent and work it out. And work it out afterwards. Yeah, you know? but if you're continuously growing organically, then you have the ability to work it out financially. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And and um, I wouldn't say anyone in the business is driven by the, the dollar as well. So we're happy to take concessions to build a better business at the end of the day because fundamentally we think that'll play out. Um, so... Where we see Unica going forward is, you know, the goal has always been to build the best advice firm in the com- in the country, if we can, um, to give the best advice that can possibly be given. Um, so if we can build from the bottom up with that with our staff and that can continue, we could potentially create something that makes a lot of difference to a lot of people's lives. And, and you do offer that. I dare I say traineeship. You offer that 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 support around um, that that second chair in meetings. Uh, I imagine that might extend to people in PY years as well. Would yep. that be right? Yeah. Yep. So we've we've got uh, we've we've done PY for one of our staff who's now AR and looking after his own A ones. Awesome. Um, and and we'll have another starting this year, um, which is really exciting for me. I like I, I really enjoy watching young advisors coming through, particularly ones that are passionate about the industry. And did you get deja vu when you started? You know what? It's so funny because I think when I started, I, I look at these guys and they they know from day one they want to be a financial advisor. That wasn't me. Yeah. You know, it took me about four years to work it out. So like, I'm always surprised by that. And particularly coming out of the the times like the Royal Commission and things like that where you know recruiting it young advice there was hard. It was, we weren't exactly getting the best press as an industry at that stage. Yeah, it wasn't a good barbecue chat, was no, it? No, not really. So so that wheel's definitely starting to turn and we're seeing some talented people coming through and, and that excites me because it you know, it, it gives you energy for a start, but it also, you know, you can see the future. Um and so that's that's the journey that I think we're on at the moment. Um, you know, we're always always interested in looking at opportunities. So if you're um if 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 you're listening to this and and um you're either in an organisation you want a fresh change or alternatively you're looking at starting on a long and fulfilling career then then definitely then you're open for business which yeah. is which is great and look that also fits really neatly into the whole philosophy with Ensemble. Ensemble was was built to promote the positive evolution of financial advice, and and my passion and and, and the reason I did this got dragged kicking and screaming <laughs> into this this role was that you can't be a good advisor unless you've got a good practice. Yeah, um, because you need to have all of those one percenters so that you can be the rock star in front of a client. It's just 
uh, let's 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 jump back to the Red Bull. Uh, it's the team that wins the comp, not yeah. the driver. Yeah, for sure. So, um, if you're if you've built a a, a, a great business that, that is a great team, then it's it's so much more pleasurable working within that team. Yeah, and you'll be so much more success. Like I believe you'll be more successful. Um, and and you guys are willing to share in the in in the game as well, right? So, yeah. so everyone, uh, you know, as, as as success begets success, there's a, there's a real democratization of that in your organisation, your yeah. vision. And I mean, the ultimate goal, I suppose, is, um, uh, you know, you make yourself redundant at the end of the day. You bring through really smart, talented people who are better than you. Well, with a 10-week old, I'm hoping that you're not thinking of that. Uh, <laughs> not yet. I've got a bit of time <laughs> left in the game. Let's, let's hope your wife's not listening to this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just don't think I'll be retiring at the grand old age of 42. But, um, you know, that's that's sort of the end goal, isn't it? To create a business that's meaningful, that um, changes your client's life, that you're proud of, and that you can pass on um, to the next generation. With that final comment, it was so profound, it was so wonderful. I'm going to thank you very much, Luke, for spending time on the Engine Room podcast today, and I wish you and your team all the success. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Russell.